Uh, he is the chairman of the Foreign Re- Council on Foreign Relations, author of the brand new book, The World of Primer. Good morning, Richard. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Yu. How are you, sir? Good. You look good on, on Skype. I like seeing you on Skype. Uh, Richard, did you know that I asked the, pre- uh, the uh, Secretary of State a question about you at the Nixon Library last week? Well, I didn't know beforehand, but uh, then my email started burning up. You got, you got a, a lot of followers down the day. All right, let me let me play it for you. After he gave his speech at the Nixon Library, I did the Q&A because I'm the president of the library. Here's my question about a tweet you had put out earlier, cut number 11. Ambassador uh, Richard Haas, who is now chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, said uh, very recently, it, it may have been yesterday, it might have been this morning, I, I saw it this morning preparing, quote, Secretary Pompeo doesn't speak of China, but of the Chinese Communist Party, if there is a China, as if there were a China apart from the party. This is meant to antagonize and make diplomacy impossible, quite a stance for America's chief diplomat to take unless his goal is to ensure diplomacy fails. <laughs> is that your goal? <laughs> ah, goodness. I, you know, I, uh, where to begin? Uh, you know, I, I, here's where I'll begin. It, it's a bit patronizing <laughs> to the people of China to make such an assertion that they are not free-thinking beings, that they're not rational people who were given... Uh, I mean, they, they too were made in the image of God, right? They, they, have, uh, they have all the capacity that anybody in the world does. So to somehow think uh, that we ought to ignore the voices of uh, the people of China seems to me uh, the wrong approach. Uh, it is true. The Chinese Communist Party uh, is a one-party rule. See? Uh, and so we will deal with the Chinese Communist Party as the head of state for China. And we need to. And we need to engage in dialogue. But it seems to me we would dishonor uh, ourselves and the people of China if we ignored them. Now, Richard Haas, you've already treated the speech like a pinata in the Washington Post. What did you make of that response to your tweet? It was actually more nuanced than than the speech. Uh, Of course, we've got to deal with the Chinese Communist Party. It's 92 million people. It controls one of the two most important countries in the uh, world. Obviously, though, that still leaves out 1.2, 1.3 million Chinese, and we should be concerned about, among other things, their human rights uh, or their lack of them, obviously in places like Hong Kong, obviously in places like the Uyghurs. My point is simply, though, you know, as I quoted, as I said in the Washington Post piece, uh, my paraphrase of Donald Rumsfeld, we've got to deal with the Chinese government that exists, not the one that we we wish exists. And that's why I thought the whole emphasis on working around it Uh, We can't work around it with the Chinese people to deal with the South China Sea or climate change or North Korea's nuclear missile or Iran. We've got to deal with the Chinese government that exists. Now, Richard, you're very experienced with the PRC and you were the head of uh, policy planning, which is the think tank in the State Department. You know them as well as anybody in the American government. What I view these seven speeches, two by the Vice President, Ambassador O'Brien, Christopher Wray, the Attorney General Mike Pompeo, and I expect one from the President, I view these seven speeches to be sort of the long telegram equivalent when it comes to recasting our policy towards China. First, do we need the equivalent? And then if we need it, have they done it the right way? Well, I think it's fair to say, you that the rise of China constitutes one of the principal challenges to U.S. foreign policy and to order in the world in this era of history. Uh, Fine. I think the problem with the administration is is how they're going about it. There's a real inconsistency, almost an incoherence uh, in their policy, an obsession with uh, a a trade deal that quite honestly is quite insignificant until recently ignoring many aspects of uh, Chinese behavior. But most important, uh, two things. Uh, One is the unwillingness to work with allies to uh, to present the united front against China. If you use your analogy of the long telegram, One of the reasons we won the Cold War is we didn't do it alone. We did it with NATO. We did it with others. Well, if that's the case, why aren't we putting together a coalition against China? And that would mean, among other things, joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, stop bashing South Korea and Japan over how much they pay to offset the costs of of U.S. uh, troops. It would mean working with others to present China with a set of uh, challenges that they they, uh, had to meet. And then to, to borrow a phrase, let's get serious about America first. If we want to, if we want to deal with China, let's out compete with them. So let's come up with a 5G alternative for broadband. Let's let's have a serious immigration system so the best and the brightest come here and, and stay here. 
let's have let's spend more federal money on basic research. So if China does represent a long-term challenge, and I'm not I'm not arguing that it doesn't, of course it does, then let's position the United States not only so we can win that challenge, so we uh, so we can meet that challenge, but so we can be, we can win that challenge. Uh, uh, now, Ambassador Haas, he did reject specifically the idea that he's advocating for containment. I I viewed it and summarized it. He didn't agree to this or disagree with it as just a policy of candor and objectivity about China. Talk about the Uyghurs. Talk about Hong Kong. Talk about the ambitions for Taiwan, and especially talk. And I'd like your opinion on this to American CEOs about their being candid of the trap that the China market has created for them. And I do believe there's a trap here that the NBA and Hollywood most obviously have fallen into. What is your advice to the American corporate elite about the PRC and the CCP? Look, uh, I think the American corporate elite has actually, in some cases, gotten a little bit more sober about China. You, In the old days, they were willing to allow China to lift their intellectual property. The feeling was, this is the price we have to pay for market access. But then China got so good at taking intellectual property and in introducing itself that it began to eat into the profits of American companies. So I think they've become a little bit more sober. I think they should also all work with one another. It's more difficult for China to deal with all of them collectively than it is to pick them off one at a time. In some cases, they're just going to have to make a choice uh, between profit and, and principle. You know, China's a significant market. On the other hand, the rest of the world outside China is a hell of a lot bigger. So in some cases, they're just going to have to make choices. Uh, Richard, it's been 35 years since I was a young counterintelligence attorney in the AG's office uh, doing the FISA warrants for the Russians and the East Germans and the Cubans. They, there was not often in those days the PRC. I believe now their Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act surveillance requests have got to be far higher than the Russians ever did. How do you view the PRC and the CCP's adversarial approach to the United States in terms of espionage relative to that which the Soviets ran? It's hard for me to weigh it. I would just say it's significant. Look what they did with the Office of Personnel Management. So I think we, we have to understand we're a priority target for, for China, both government stuff as well as the, the private sector. We've got to do a much better job of protecting critical uh, information. I don't much like it. I expect you know when we see Chinese military aircraft that look we're almost like carbon copies of American military aircraft. That's no, that's no coincidence. Obviously, China needs to be an important intelligence target uh, for us. This is, you know, this is the real world. And I, I don't think, our, I, but I do think you, there's an important distinction between what you might call traditional intelligence targets and economic targets, where China is trying to get intellectual property. And I think there, again, we've got to push back. And that's why, again, I like, I'd much rather have it do, us do it with other allies uh, in, in groups like the Trans-Pacific Partnership to put pressure on China to adhere to certain standards. So another reason, by the way, we shouldn't be trashing the World Trade Organization. We should be reforming it. So groups like China, countries like China would pay a price if they do violate uh, intellectual property protection. Now, in the world of Primer, you talked about the rules-based order. So did Secretary Pompeo. But he did do something different. I wonder if you think it's possible. He said, we need a new organization, a new grouping of the free nations of the world. I thought it was sort of like shedding of the skin of the old rules-based order to say the UN, the WTO, the WHO, they're too corrupt. We have to start over. What's your response, Richard Haas? Look, there, there's already things like the Coalition of Democracies. I'd, I'd say two things. One is this administration, its own commitment to democracy here at home, shall we say, is somewhat suspect given some of the things that's going on, the attack on free media, the attack on independent judiciary. You. Uh, I also think we can't be selective and just pick on China. Let's pick on Turkey. Let's pick on Russia. Let's pick on North Korea. I would like to have an American foreign policy that's more consistent pro-democracy. Let me make a larger point, though, which I think you're getting at, about multilateralism. I don't think the answer is in the, the organization. What we need to look at in each area of the world, whether it's dealing with North Korea or Iran or climate or regulating the, uh, the uh, cyberspace, uh, dealing with global health, we need to look at what existing institutions are there, whether they're up to the task. Most of them are not. Then we've got to say, what's our reform agenda? Maybe we need to create a new, a new institution, not with everybody. We don't need to model the world on the UN General Assembly. That's a failure. What we need are probably much smaller, much more nimble institutions with like-minded countries that are relevant, 
task specific. So I actually think we need a, a new approach to multilateralism, but it can't be one size fits all. What we've got to do is almost designer multilateralism, say, what can we accomplish? Who can we accomplish it with? Richard, great to have you. I don't agree with you about there being an attack on the free judiciary or the free press, but that's a subject for another time. I reject that, but I always welcome Richard Haas. Thank you, my friend. Don't